Welcome to Bringing People Together. There's all this technology at the moment, and that's something that we want to support um, people with in bringing people together. It's knowing how to deal with technology and really how to make people feel welcome and included and that um, it's okay to talk. However we can talk, we are going to try and talk. So I'm from Transforming Communities Together. These are all my colleagues. We, as I said, we've got two colleagues on today, James Henderson and Shaz Akhtar. Transforming Communities Together does all sorts of work, including com community cohesion, which includes places of welcome, bringing people together, near neighbours, and a thing called shared silence. And today I'll talk to you about bringing people together. It's all about connecting people to others from the comfort of their ho own home. What does that mean? Well, um, you can find out more from a website, but we're aware that websites aren't always that useful because sometimes technology fails. Um, so it's giving telephone numbers, it's being in, being open to people is the important thing and being welcoming. So therefore, when we thought about what this would look like, we decided that we needed to have a platform that people could join by telephone and online. Um, we've got an issue with people who are housebound before uh, the pandemic, but now majority of us are housebound. And how do we connect? How do we make friends? We thought we needed to make sure that um, it was still quite neighbourhood based. So all of our groups are based in an area. Some areas are bigger than others, and we want because that will include long ongoing friendships that may develop outside of a bringing people together group. They're connected by a host. Um, we actually ask for two hosts, um, and then we have an organisation who serves the community, and we have a set of the same principles that are all about inviting everyone, welcoming everyone, and respecting everyone. And it starts, um, it was a, it's a pilot across the Black Country, Staffordshire and North Shropshire. And James, um, my colleague, at the end of the formal bit of our meeting, will um, talk about uh, what the future of bringing people together is. So the practicalities. We asked for two hosts to run a group. We asked for a partner organisation. We're aware that lots of mutual aid groups had set up at the beginning of the pandemic. And how were we going to enable them, these amazing volunteers to run groups? Well, we separated out the need for the host to be part of a partner organisation. The hosts only need to be known by a partner organisation. And that partner organisation supplies any safeguarding and GTBAR policies and also references the host. What we provide is a network. We provide training. Um, we provide a website and we provide marketing materials. We make we um, make the um, sorry, I've got emails coming in. Um, we make um, JPEGs and um, PDFs that mean that you can publicise your group. What the group needs is. Um, a, a Zoom Pro account, and we were like, that costs money. So we um, uh, funded to provide um, for six months up to 50 organisations in the Black Country, Staffordshire and North Shropshire, um, six months of Zoom Pro account. Uh, we understand that groups could run on other um, platforms, but Zoom Pro works, and um, if you find one that works better than Zoom Pro, and we do in the training, we cover what that need, what the needs are for that. Um, then please use that. Okay. The principles are um, a lot wordier than inviting everyone, welcoming everyone, and uh, offering mutual respect. And these are them. It's um, you can read them. BPT, if you're on a big enough device, um, BPT groups are open to everyone, aiming to include everyone from their neighbourhood who wants to meet new people or who is feeling socially isolated. It's for the purpose of the pilot, we've, we enable a small number of groups that may self-identify a particular feature. 
Um, and we're going to hear, be hearing from some hosts who run groups that have identifying features. So it may be, I don't know, everyone experiencing homelessness in a particular area. So um, we welcome everyone. We want them to be safe spaces. And that means knowing the technology well enough. Again, that's why we need the training. And we aim to reflect the diversity of the people in the neighbourhood. And then let's offer everyone mutual respect. Let's, we aim to value the contributions of everybody. Okay. So coming on to today, we're probably going to be talking for about the, hour, the first hour um, on structured things. And then we open the group to question and answers. Please, if you're able to use the chat, um, function. And if you want to send a question in, please put it in capitals. So you can write those at any point during the next hour and afterwards. And once we open for question and answer, you can ask in person. So today we've got the lovely Amanda Mallon, uh, um, who is speaking. She runs the group with um, Reverend Hel Helen ba Baby. And she runs Open Space Wolverhampton, bringing people together. And she's going to talk about the first question that we tackled as a um, organisation. How are we going to get people together when our venues are closed? And then we've got the lovely Maz Kari, and she's from Dudley Women's Bringing People Together. She's from a... Um, Brilliant. And she's going to look at how we um, use new technology so that everyone has the right device or the right knowledge. And then I've got Reverend David Babington from um, Emmaus, um, Wolverhampton, bringing people together and outside in uh, Warsaw, which is in Warsaw. And that's a bringing people together group. And he's going to talk uh, about his group, but also about how we grow in confidence when we keep people safe online. And then my colleague, uh, as I've mentioned, James Henderson, will finish off the more formal bit and talk about how what what's going to happen with bringing people together and um, how maybe you might be involved or just the questions that we um, look at to move on from where we are at the moment. So now I'm going to hand over to Amanda. Let me stop share. Fortunately, we don't think do things like sh stop sharing. So I'm going to find Amanda on my list and then hand over to Amanda. If you can unmute Amanda, that would be amazing. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here with all of you today. Um, thinking about the question, how do we get people together uh, when our buildings are closed is pretty much the same sort of question we would ask ourselves if our buildings were open. How do we get people together? How do we tell them that there is a place for them, that they are welcomed, that it's open to all, that they can bring their dogs if they feel the need, um, that they can be themselves? How do we do that? Um, and that's what we were doing in our places of welcome when our buildings were actually open. Uh, and it, we used to, you know, attract quite diverse groups of people. So it seemed to Helen and I that it would be a logical step that if we couldn't meet together, that maybe we should move this online and do these virtual coffee mornings because we are filling and meeting a need in our communities. Every one of you will know the needs of your community and the, the requirements that people in and around your communities um, would look for in a place. Now, if you can't physically go out and find that, the way we need to move forward is, is basically just getting the word out there that there is a place that people can come. And you know what? Just have a rant if they feel the need. Everyone needs a rant every now and again, um, particularly in these times, because friends, these are really difficult times that we're living through. Um, and I don't know about your groups, but even though our group is open and welcoming to everyone, we have seemed to attract uh, a certain kind of, of people at this point. Um, people that may have specific mental health needs um, and need a little bit more support and are feeling very isolated by being stuck at home. 
at least this way, it gets them out of themselves. Um, and we've been doing all sorts of things. I know Sue was talking a bit earlier on about what we do in the first few minutes. Uh, we've we've had videos playing where we've been on live zoo days. Um, we do quizzes every week. We've had um, a get a name that tune type of thing, all sorts of things, just to get the conversation going. Uh, and there is sometimes when, you know what, there is no conversation, but that's OK, because we are together, gathered in the one place. And it's about making people comfortable to say nothing or comfortable to say whatever they need to do. It's about being a warm and welcoming place. And that's what you would expect if your buildings were open. So why should it be different online? Now, inevitably, it is different because everyone is sat in a fixed position looking at the screen. So it's not that easy to move around and make a drink or go sit in another part of the room if you're a little bit fed up or, you know, if someone's talking about a subject that you find absolutely boring or you just can't can't stand, there's nothing wrong with turning your camera off, muting yourself and, you know, taking yourself off for five minutes and then coming back. There's still the freedoms there in Zoom, even though it is a little bit more limited than, than it may be in our buildings. But it's all about getting the word out there, sharing the news and making the people that come along to these groups share the news with other people. Because it's all right us putting adverts out and, and telling people that we're there. But actually, the best way to get people to come along is for the people who join our group to come along and tell them it's a good thing. It's our group. We think it's great. Otherwise, we would do it differently. So why would people listen to us? They need to be listening to the people who are coming to these groups. And that's what we need. You just get the word out. Tell people, bore people, tell them again. Tell them again and again. And just keep sharing it because it's really, it's a good space and it's important. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, Amanda. There we go. And so I'm now moving on to our fabulous Maz. So um, Amanda's group, as I said, started up very early on. Maz's group started up early on as a WhatsApp group. And um, she uh, came to bringing people together, I think probably September. We started in July. Um, and Maz came, uh, was a colleague, um, Shaz, introduced us and uh, let me let Maz take over the story. You're muted, Maz. Good morning, everybody. So lovely to see so many faces. And thank you, Sue, for giving me the opportunity to share our group's experiences of connecting with our service users and members in the pandemic. I'm the managing director and founding member of Turning Points. It's a group supporting women predominantly from the South Asian communities in Lai, who have language barriers among so many other barriers. Most of our work has been face-to-face -face prior to the pandemic. We offered English learning, confidence building initiatives, outings, get togethers, raising awareness and providing information in community languages and so much more to build and improve women's health and social well-being and thus their quality of life. With COVID-19 crisis, we were faced with the biggest challenge ever of how we stay connected with our service users when most of them were not only illiterate in their in English, but also illiterate in their mother tongue language, and many had not used a computer or a smartphone or had access to it. So I guess I realized that this was a time when we needed to stay connected the most as it meant quite literally a matter of life and death as the pandemic was taking lives at a drastic rate with Dudley being a, a hotspot. So the question was quite rightly how we connect with those who do not have the knowledge, the language and the technology to connect 
and were in most need to connect because it was a group which was at high risk a group to the virus and a group that was being disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So we set about very early on last April, uh, last year and explored, trialed and ventured out in doing uh, some of the following things. We set up a women's COVID-19 support group on WhatsApp uh, to connect the ladies on the group, give them information, translate information from the, the government. Uh, we also acquired training um, of Zoom from online videos and set up weekly connect Zoom sessions with the help of Shaz, who supplied the Zoom account to us. And we set up online sessions with those who had smartphones and tablets. I myself felt very uneasy and totally freaked out uh, when using Zoom because it was so new and it felt like alien kind of way of doing things. It was, it was such a new concept. The challenge of making others feel at ease and making them feel welcome with the added challenges of language barriers and the need to be patient and creating an atmosphere of everyone feeling involved and engaged was all whizzing around in my mind in each session, prior to each session, and also not forgetting the planning of each session that we had to do, sending out reminders and translating details and supporting those who were feeling totally uncomfortable with, with this concept of Zoom and coming online. So these were the questions and challenges we were confronted with uh, prior to the sessions, after the sessions, even during the sessions. And this was the case for those who did have access to technology and, and tablets and laptops. So those who did not have smartphones, tablets, and were, and were unsure of how to use it to connect to Zoom. We developed audio messages in community languages, explaining step by step how to download the Zoom app, where to click, what to do. We researched and found videos of instructions in community languages of how to use Zoom on a tablet and phones, and we circulated those to the, to the ladies and the families. We identified those who still needed help and phoned them and went through with them instructions step by step, again, to assist them uh, in making them feel comfortable. We were able to alter some of our funding and utilize it to purchase some tablets that we let our ladies have because they didn't have um, any, any electrical device to access. And when there wasn't a lockdown, we were on the ladies' doorsteps, uh, obviously, obviously socially distanced. And, and we showed them through just um, with our fingertips exactly what button to press um, and how to actually uh, click the Zoom link. The Zoom link we kept as simple as possible with no ID or no password to begin with. So a message went out regarding the sessions in their um, community language written and supported by an audio message as well. We have a group developed for all ladies who needed translation, translated messages. And on that group, we ensured that they received personalized support to join the Zoom sessions. We planned an online celebration event in November to launch actually our BPT group um, for our members and asked everyone to join us. And in pre preparation for this, we planned phone calls and sent out translated uh, video messages, audio messages, just to help everybody to actually join in with this event. We tried a few sessions, we did some demos, we were told all, um, where we told all the ladies to connect to this demo and how to do it, just so we could get a feel of the ladies uh, were able to um, follow the instructions that we've been handing out and showing them. So um, I was online when the ladies were coming online and we had um, as uh, team members on the phone. So ladies were phoning to say, I'm having difficulty, what number do I press? or what click, uh, what link is it? So we had ladies helping them in their community languages whilst we were online and, and, and trying to uh, do the demo of showing them what the icons meant in their languages as well as English. Uh, the first of the larger event, we had around 60 ladies join us and we had two other ladies assisting, like I said. We also had two hosts to manage the technical side of things. We then had another larger event planned for December where we had over 100 women connect. And we were obviously feeling uh, exhilarated. We did all what we did uh, in, in all the previous sessions before, and we did so much more to ensure that we actually get as many uh, of our members online. 
and we did so much in preparing for the event and we were like i said so glad that we were able to uh, get so many ladies and their families online and although we had uh, the maximum 100 people get on zoom to that session on each of the devices there were at least two or three people part of the family on there so we had well over 100 I, I would say at that event so in a nutshell how were we able to connect these ladies is that we offered personalized culturally and linguistically appropriate support to help them get connected we remained in regular contact over phones, WhatsApp messages, and online activities. And we even went to the extent of providing them with electronic devices and tablets by discussing with our funders how we better manage some of the funds to meet the immediate needs of our clients. We are proud and delighted that we have helped in this pandemic to get our members online, many of which have never switched on a com computer before. We have further built on the need of connecting these women in times of difficulty, which has enabled our service users to stay connected and grow from those connections, feel part of a community by joining the groups that we've got going. They've been expressing themselves creatively and artistically through weekly challenges and activities. They've been, been able to make their voices heard, especially people who feel cut off or excluded. Um, and they've been sharing their stories and issues and fears. Looking, they've also been looking out for each other and sharing acts of kindness, reaching out to the vulnerable on their streets, their neighbors, and, and sharing those stories with us. And, and also what's so brilliant to see is that they've actually been able to brace technology. They've been able to brace and you know overcome some of their fears. So the no's and don't know's and don't want to try have now become cans and do's and will do, which is which is really great for us to see and hear. We have been sharing prayers, hopes, wishes, and messages of comfort and emotional support, connecting, uh, you know, connecting women, and also the adaptation and processing of grief and changes in lifestyle has become a prominent aspect of our group in terms of the activities and, and, the, and the WhatsApp group we have, where women have been reflecting on what's important and, and, and being grateful and taking the time to focus on health and wellness. And as a result, we have, we have a very proactive health and wellness group, which now has a dedicated wellness guru um, who supports women on a daily basis about what they're eating, about how to look after themselves, taking time out, fitness videos, sharing recipes, chats, uh, you know, so much for these women to actually not just stay connected, but build and grow from the connections. We have been able to inspire people, hel helping them in turning the tide. We are documenting stories of women and the experiences. We're doing vlogs to celebrate International Women's Week that's coming up and so much more. And to just to finish off, I want to say thank you to Shaz from Near Neighbours and the Near Neighbours team for getting us on Zoom at the very outset, the start of the pandemic, when you know we needed the opportunity to start looking into how we bring these women online and our activities online. Thank you to Sue and the BP team um, who have given us the training and the support and the opportunity and the encouragement to continue and build on our work and who have been giving us these sort of opportunities to share our stories, to share our experiences. And, and I think it's really important that we do a lot of sharing because it's through sharing and, and, and telling people about our challenges and our fears and how we are overcoming them that we can actually grow and learn and, and, and build these experiences into our own ways of working so that we can try and uh, you know, to provide the, the support that our, our communities need. So thank you so much for listening to our experiences and, and, um, and, and it's, been, it's been a lovely experience being part of uh, BPT and also the bigger overarching near neighbors and TCT. So thank you very much. Thank you, Shaz. Uh, Maz, sorry, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> Thank you, Maz. Maz has been an amazing inspiration to me, just the amount of work she puts in to keep these women connected and um, I just keep learning from her. Um, finally, the person that's uh, the next of our BPT hosts that's going to speak is Dave, uh, Reverend David Babington. 
and I'll just spotlight him. He uh, he runs two groups for us, one that's been running and only just joined as a BPT and one that uh, has been a BPT for a bit longer called Emmaus and um, he'll tell us more about what he's been up to. Thank you, David. If you can unmute, sorry. Ah, there we go. I finally did it. Hello, everyone. Um, well, I, I run two different groups. Um, my role, I have a very strange role for Litchfield Diocese. So um, I run a parish, but I also am the regional ambassador for inclusive church. Um, so therefore, I cover the whole area that Litchfield Diocese covers. So therefore, you know, one single person covering the whole of the biggest area diocese in the country so small job um, a small person um, and then on top of that I deal with all the LGBT issues for Staffordshire, Shropshire and the black country and so therefore these two groups were set up with that in mind. One of the groups um, I was invited to a church in um, Wolverhampton that were asked me to come in because they noticed that some of their parishioners were asylum seekers and they were asylum seekers but as they started speaking to them they realized that the reason they were actually seeking asylum was because of their sexuality. Now the sexuality was another area that they'd never ever had to deal with before so I was brought in so we had discussions and we would have regular meetings at the church then we had lockdown. Now these people relied upon our regular meetings and suddenly we had to find something new. So we moved online. The question is how do you stay online and maintain the safety of those individuals um, who rely upon everything that you've got and know that they've got hardly any money at all because they're only given about £30 a week to live on, how can they therefore access this service that they need to try and gain their freedom in this country? And so we had to tackle all of these pro problems all at the same time and work out how to do it. So the first thing we realised was that the church as a whole had a real problem with, as you would have known, there's a problem when you take photographs, that there's always a problem with people who like to photobomb. They'll jump into your photograph at the moment when you least want them to. Well, people would sometimes do that with when you'd set up a Zoom account. If they disagreed with what you were doing, they would then join in. So we realised we couldn't freely give out the name of our, our meeting and the password so as we could give it to everybody because it compromised the safety and security of the individuals who were coming to the group. Also, those individuals who were coming to the group wanted to share elements of their lives. So the whole thing we were doing was teaching them how to learn to share their stories with one another. So as then when they went to court, they could share their stories freely. So therefore, there needed to be that security. So what this program and, and bringing people together has given us is a new way of doing things. And we had to rethink how we in this particular group would do things. So what we've done is we set up a way that people would first telephone in. So they would telephone in to ring and speak to a set of three individuals. And those individuals then would decide whether or not the person was definitely an asylum seeker. So we got asylum seekers to work out if they were asylum seekers, because they are the best people to know whether an asylum seeker is genuine or not. And then when they were genuine, we put them into a WhatsApp group. So they joined a WhatsApp group. So as everybody outside of the meeting can communicate with one another, so they are permanently in, in, in communication with one another. If somebody's in need at any time, they can ask for help and everybody can get in touch and help each other all the time. So it's a simple way that they can do it. Then every time a meeting comes up, 
we pop the details of the meeting into that WhatsApp group and everybody comes into the meeting and we hold the meeting. So then people will come along to the meeting um, and people, we then realised when they came to the meeting um, that we had the restrictions because of the cost for some of those people coming to the meeting. So we had to address those issues. So we used to have a meeting that would take two hours. So we suddenly realised, right, we've got to cut our meetings down to an hour. So we had to limit the amount of time that we could do because of the amount of time they could spend on the phone. The next thing that we had to do was be practical. So I know that some people have been talking about whether or not you should show your face on, on Zoom meetings or not show your face on Zoom meetings. If you show your face on a Zoom meeting, it eats up your data. So data costs money and people don't have money. So often people will come on, they'll show their face to prove that it's them, and then we just have the voice. And it's, and it's not about them wanting to shy away, but it is about creating that accessibility for people. And therefore, they'll sometimes have the ability to ring in, in on occasions, and they can ring in for up to an hour. But if we go over that hour, it suddenly has cost them money. So we have to make sure that we stop at the right time. If we say we start at a time, we say we finish at a time, we have to do what we say we will do. So they know what they've got. So people will come along and they will join in in that way. We will then set up extra things and we will have breakout groups within that. So therefore people can have discussion. So they will go into groups of three or four. So therefore, instead of a great big group, so when we used to meet in person and people had to travel in, we'd often have 10 people. Now I'll have nearly 40 people on Zoom. So we've grown in number through going online. So therefore, it's, this has actually helped us. So therefore, those people will then go into smaller groups and they'll talk about things in a very intimate way. And they know about the need for confidentiality because of the level of trust that's grown up. But then we've got another group that's grown up, which is outside in, which is based in Walsall. And this is a very different group. This is again an LGBT group, but then this group has to look at the whole issue of um, social inclusion for people who feel isolated and alone. And lockdown was a particularly bad thing because there are no social groups for the LGBT community in Walsall at all. So therefore, what do we provide for people when suddenly they're locked down and they feel isolated, they feel alienated by those around them, and they suddenly have to stay in the same house as them where the people who they're with don't like them. So they need to have people who support them. So we've had people turn up to a meeting and they never say a word and we never see them, but they will sit at home with their headphones on, watching what's going on and typing in a few messages in the chat saying, I can't say anything because my family are here. So we have to tailor the meeting every single time for the individuals who are there. So it's not about a general generic way of doing things, but every single group that starts up is always different and you tailor it to who's there. So we've got some people who've come to our group now who are deaf. So we've got somebody who, is a sign, who teaches sign language who comes to our group and signs for them. So therefore we meet the need of what's there. You can't preempt everything but you do what's there. With the group in Wolverhampton, we started off, we were a Christian LGBT asylum seeker group. And what we suddenly found was that we had several people who were Muslim who came along who were asylum seekers. And so we automatically said, well, we both come from Allah. So therefore we can worship Allah together and therefore we help each other together. And therefore, those two people have now been granted asylum because they listened not about the differences, but about how we can actually work together. And they are now within the group trying to help other people. So it's not just about 
how you do things in the group. It's about building long-term relationships and about making accessible relationships and the group accessible for everybody. So you tailor it for what's there. And one of the things that we found in, in a lot of ways is that we will sometimes record things that we will do in, in what we're doing. Now, the thing about recording is that, and um, Paul mentioned it earlier on about um, data protection. First of all, there is an issue with data protection if you're recording something and you've got music or you've got video and things like that, and you're then putting it out somewhere else, there may be an issue with that. But if you've got a conversation going on, you've got individuals who are leading the conversation, you're recording them, and others are participating, and you've advised everybody, and you've given people the option to turn their camera off, and everybody knows what's going on, then everything is absolutely fine that you can record the meeting. People have the option to leave the meeting if they don't want to be at the meeting, or they can turn their camera off. So you're giving all those options to be able to safeguard everything. The other one final thing that we do is that because it's built in to, both of them are built into the churches, we build into the safeguarding procedures of the churches. So therefore the group that takes place in Walsall, in Walsall we have the safeguarding officer from the church who actually attends the meetings. So therefore, she is a part of the leadership team of the meeting. So we, are, we place safeguarding as the central element of every single thing that we do. So that's the way that you keep people safe. You put safeguarding at the front and you don't do it as an add-on at the end because then it's just natural to every single thing that you do. I hope that helps. Thank you, David. That was very, very helpful, very helpful. Um, and those are three of our BPT group hosts. I could have chosen um, many of them because each group is individual. I do like to say that um, we don't, um, as BPT, we, we, BPT is about the meeting, not what happens outside the meeting. It's up to your the individual organisation how they keep in touch with people because that's quite complex. WhatsApp is quite a complex app because everybody sees the um, details for everyone. So each organisation deals with the connection with their, um, their participants in their own way. Um, I'd like to move on. Um, thank you to everybody. Thank you uh, who shared so far. Um, my colleague, James Henderson, is now going to speak about what's the future for BPT. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, such a privilege to be here and chatting to some of you via the chat today. Thank you so much for your time. Um, so, yeah, we've been delighted to be uh, part of bringing people together. It was an initial idea um, based on our, uh, we do a lot of work with the Place of Welcome movement, which I, I guess many of you will know. Um, but because they were based in a physical place, um, and physical places sadly weren't able to open. We wanted to look at how we could use those values of open to all and, uh, and inclusivity and, uh, and just a real genuine welcome to start to reach out to people who were at home, who were maybe feeling quite lost and, and, and quite um, unsafe and quite isolated. And, and so that's how we were able to work with the National Lottery to come up with this um, idea of BPT, kind of learning from people like Amanda and Maz, who were who kind of already um, uh, um, kind of leaders in, in that field, I think. Um, and we've got to the stage now. So, so our initial thing was just uh, going to be the Black Country, Staffordshire and Northern Shropshire, which is the area that our charity works in. Um, but we're delighted to be part of other networks which go England wide. So we're delighted to work with Near Neighbours and we've got uh, colleagues from Near Neighbours hubs with us today. And we've also got colleagues from the uh, Church and Fund Together network as well. And um, part of the idea of these networks is to share ideas. It's to look at what's working in one area so we can look at an area that's happening say in Leicester or something like that and see if that area uh, see if those ideas will work in 
in our area and, and so um, our idea today is just to be able to reciprocate that to be able to look at offering this to other areas um, so we have um, been fortunate to get another um, we've, we've had another lot of funding from the lottery and as part of that we wanted to just start to explore it was the interest in other areas of the country could we share um, the things that we've learned through doing this process with other groups and could we um, start to start to look at that expanding into other areas so I guess this is just really us dipping our toe in the water really um, you've he you've heard from some great speakers about what it's like to run a BPT group um, what's on offer um, we do have a training package that Sue has very kindly developed um, and we we are just starting to look at offering that to other groups so if you've been interested from today um, we'd be very open to you contacting us and looking at how we might might be able to help to support you to set up a BPT group in, in a new area. Um, so do get in touch with Sue as your kind of first port of call. Um, we're just wanting to register interest really to get an idea of how many people are interested. Um, and then we can start to look at um, a plan for, for rolling that out in other areas. Um, but uh, yeah, just hugely thankful uh, for you all for, for giving up this morning to be with us.